Hello everyone, I'm Allison Law and we are here at the Grammy Museum at the 30th anniversary of the We Are The World single written by Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie. Stay tuned to our celebrity interviews. First year, can you tell me, We Are The World, what does that mean for you and your organization? Well, first of all, We Are The World is one of the most unbelievable songs in the world. It is an anthem. It is a people's anthem. I mean, the song is used all over the world for all kinds of causes and efforts and everything. But thanks to We Are The World, I mean, USA for Africa was able to achieve its goal, which it came about, which was to, to, to help the situation at that time in Africa, and to continue to do that for now 30 years. And from across the country, who, who uh, is your biggest supporters right now? Right now, I have to be honest with you, our biggest supporters is Japan. Wow. That's where most of our uh, most of the money comes from. That's they still buy the song. Um, that's that's where most of our money have come from for the last ten years. And how come everyone out there uh, support We Are the World um, USA for Africa? The way to support us still is buying the song. If you still when you buy the song, we still get the money. Why did you decide to go with making a charity single versus making a charity, doing a charity concert? Well, you know, Harry Belafonte came to me with the idea of doing a concert, but I've been trying for a year to organize a concert with no luck. So I said, look, Bob Geldof in London has done Do They Know It's Christmas, the Band-Aid single. They're doing very well with it. There's no patent on that idea. Let's do it. And we had bigger artists here. We had Michael Jackson, number one in the world. Lionel Richie was number two. I just started on the Billboard charts, worked my way down, and got artists after artists to do it mm -hmm. and once the you know by the way once Bruce Springsteen signed in I never had to make an outgoing call <laughs> everybody <laughs> called me everybody called me so you had a lot of people wanting to be on this single how did yeah. you go about uh, picking your talent I literally took the billboard record charts and went right down who's number one who's number two who's number three a few turned me down not very many one or two but basically I got everybody who was because what I want to do was sell records I wanted to raise money I wanted to feed people so I needed the biggest artists in the world, and that's fortunately what we were able to get. How did you go about getting the producer, uh, Quincy Jones, on this song? Uh, I knew Quincy very well. I picked up the phone. He was getting on a plane for uh, his vacation in Hawaii. It was the day before Christmas. And I said, will you produce this record? He said, yes, absolutely. I said, can you get Michael involved? He said, I'll call you back. 30 minutes later, he called me back. He said, Michael doesn't just want to perform. He wants to help write the song. So what was it like having the uh, room full of all those diverse oh, artists? Boy. It was one of the thrilling moments of my life. I, the biggest thing I remember is sitting on the floor at 8 in the morning after the recording session with Quincy, Diana Ross, myself. We were hugging each other. We were, it was, it was just an, one of these moments where we were all crying, emotion. Tom Baylor, the, the arranger, was there. We, there was just a small group of us left, and it was just so <laughs> moving, you know, that evening. You know, you wish you could go back and do it all over again. You know, I think in a way, along with Band Aid, it launched, we, we went from the me generation of the 1970s to the us generation of the 80s. Suddenly we were inspiring people, people wanted to help others. The big theme was now, what can we do to help others? And along came Live Aid and Farm Aid and Hands Cross America. All of these things, there were recordings done in countries like a dozen countries around the world of different songs to help people. So, and, and, and that tradition has lasted even to today. You see it when there's a tsunami, you know, in, in Asia. All of a sudden, there's a huge gathering of artists to do something about it. Uh, I think we really turned a corner. So, do you think uh, music has changed since the 80s to now? You know, the core hasn't changed. We're still delivering emotion. We're still delivering excitement and moving people with the, with the music. What has changed is the delivery system. 
What changes over time is the delivery system. What never changes in music is its need to inspire people, to move people, to, you know, to be the love song, or to be what you work out to, or whatever else. So, you know, that's, that's the key to it.